Jaksun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasaya Bhutale Srimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gorvani Pracharine Nirvisesa Sunyavadi Pasyatya De Satarine Panchakalpa Turu Vishcha Kripa Sindhu Bevacha Dita nam pavane vyo vaishnave vyo namaho namaha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Srivasari Gaur Bhatta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare So before I begin, I'm kind of giving you a and I have to say a very brief and synoptic uh, overview on the last two verses because these verses are really, really, really hard to penetrate and they're also very difficult to understand. And usually when I do this seminar, I do the whole thing and these last two verses I don't really give much attention to, only because <clears throat> It's, I mean, there will be some, we can be, but to go really into these verses deeply really is on the highest platform of ecstatic love. And so to, I mean, there are people who are qualified to speak about this, so I don't put myself in that category. But before we start, this last session from verse 7 and verse 8, I want to just go quickly through the whole six verses that we already did to show you, or to revive your memory on uh, what is actually being transpired or shown in a progressive way in these verses. Uh, the Acharyas analyze these verses in different categories and also have a different way of explaining them in terms of the category. But essentially I'll pick one of the explanations that the Bhakti Siddhanta, <clears throat> he says that the first verse, now we're, we're speaking about the nine processes of Bhakti, Adao Strata, Saru Sangha, Vajana Kriya, Anartha Nivriti, Nishta, Ruchi, Ashakti, Bhava, Prema in separation, Prema in meeting. So these are the eight verses. And according to the progression that one traverses as they go to higher and higher levels of spiritual realization. So the first verse is faith. Uh, Sadhu Sangha, association with the Bodhi and taking shelter of the bona fide spiritual master. And of course, in that first verse, the seven benedictions were delineated nicely. So that sets the stage for the understanding, the knowledgeable stage of what the glories of the Holy Name have to offer us in terms of our practice and our spiritual advancement. And then, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he's putting himself in the position of a, of a bhakta, one who's practicing pure devotional service. And then, when he explains the second verse, he ends it, although there is so much mercy, benefit, unlimited amounts of spiritual knowledge available, and practice, and there's no rules, no regulations. Krishna's name is available for everyone. He says, Dordaivam. And that's the end of the second verse, and he means that I'm, I'm unfortunate. Although so much is offered, I think we were hearing from Buddha Bhavana Prabhu, how this process is so magnanimous, so powerful, and so available. And it's like, you know, putting money into our account. 
Still, we fail to go to the bank. <laughs> or we make withdrawals, and sometimes we go into the red. We even withdraw more than we actually have. And that is due to offenses. And so then, the next verse, as it was explained, Trinatopi, Sunid Chena, humility, tolerance, pridelessness, and respect, giving respect to all other living entities, no matter what body they may be in, um, brings one to the point of freeing themselves from the tendency of committing offenses. By practicing these qualities, we, when you're humble, and you learn to be tolerant, and you see Krishna in the hearts of others, and you're not really looking for anything from yourself, then you won't commit offenses. You just won't. <laughs> because you're in the proper consciousness to be free from that, those, that, that mentality and that activity which causes one to commit offense. Of course, there's accidental things, but these are easily overshadowed. But the ones that are mentioned as Shastric statements, we have to be very, very careful, especially offenses to the Vaishnavas. And then what is the result? Kirtaniya Siddhartahina. We, we can chant the holy names. Continuously, we develop a attraction for that. Now, the next one, the next verse, uh, so number two is an Anartanivrti. Number three, as mentioned, is nishta. We're fixed in devotional service. You're not purified yet, but you're fixed. And you've freed yourself from enough material desires and attachments, and you have the pri proper mood that uh, you can uh, stay fixed despite... Fixed means whatever happens, you stay fixed in your service to Krishna. You're not, this, your service is not deviated by happiness, distress, or whatever may come. And that's when 75% of the anarthas are removed. And then you can reach nishta. The other 25% is a tendency that we may also commit offenses. Now, there is one particular story that shows that even on the high, uh, very high platform, one can commit offense. And that was the story of, I forgot the name of that sadhu, I think his, his name was Rupa Raghunath. Rupa Kaviraj. Rupa Kaviraj, Rupa Kaviraj yeah. And uh, Krishna Priya? Takarani. Yeah, Krishna, yeah. Krishna Takarani. So he, he was an orator and very well known for his orations on the Vedas. Speaks very nicely, had, had good knowledge, had a large following. And in one of his gatherings, this uh, lady, and she was a great devotee, her name was Krishna Takarani, sometimes they say Krishna Priya. And, but her, her quality is that she could not stop chanting even if she wanted to. She was so absorbed in chanting the holy name, and she decided to come to his lecture. So she sat, and she was sitting in the back, and then he saw that she was chanting, and he was going to be speaking. He said to her, your mind, can you, can you play, put your mind on what is about to be said and to chant at the same time? So in other words, she was challenged. And being very humble by nature, she didn't respond to his attack. And then he started to get really heavy with her, saying that, you know, you should be, if you're coming here, you should be attentive, not doing anything else. But he was quite strong in his words. In other words, his mood was, he was offended that she would be in the, there and chanting while he was speaking. But, and she remained humble, still kept chanting. <laughs> and uh, 
Eventually, later on, he, of course he committed offenses by criticizing her, especially in public. And uh, after a while, his creeper of devotion started to dry up. And then he actually fell from his position. He was on the platform of Bhava. And he fell from his position and he became engaged again in material activities. So this is an example of, you know, how Vaishnava offenses can, can finish your creeper. So these things can carry all the way up to Prema Bhakti. It says when you see Krishna face to face, only then there is no possibility of offenses. So even great souls sometimes bridge or go beyond that line and make some wrong statement or say something. It might be due to a little bit of pride, and usually is, due to a little bit of pride of their, of their advancement in spiritual life. <clears throat> um, Mm, her or him? No, the orator. Yeah, uh, was I thought it was Krishna uh, Raga, uh, Rupa Raghunath, but he, it's Rupa Kaviraj. So I think, yeah, yeah. What what uh, Bhutta Bhavana said is correct. Rupa Kaviraj. Because mm -hmm. there's another one, Rupa Raghunath, too, who was also a great orator. Um, and so that stage is the anartha nivritti nishta, you're fixed. And then as you continue to chant and engage in devotional service, you move forward to the next stage, which is ruchi. And in that stage, there is a, there is a sweet taste that develops. Uh, Buddha Bhavana really turned the nectar of that yesterday, in yesterday's class. How, uh, how that, that taste develops and how one simply sees material life as simply garbage. <laughs> no interest, it's, it simply becomes something, you know, like something that's avoidable. Not only avoidable, something that one has no desire for. Even the greatest thing, money, wealth, position, followers, pleasures of the opposite sex, all of these seem, seem to be insignificant on that stage, at least to some degree, at least on the gross level. <laughs> and so that, that, that level is, uh, and there's, there's two elements of ruchi. One is uh, excellence of elements and uh, Elements without excellence. <laughs> that means that persons are on that stage when they are engaged in any kind of spiritual activity. If it is done nicely, they become happy and ecstatic. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hare Krishna. And there's those who do not require the excellence of elements. If it's a kirtan, doesn't matter who's singing or how, whether they sing in tune or whether the instruments are aligned with the, you know, the melody. Because it's a kirtan, they still feel transcendental pleasure. That's a higher stage of ruchi. So you can judge for yourself whether you're on that stage. <laughs> If you need the kirtan to be melodious and, and the singer has to be, you know, paka and all like that. Because Bhakti Siddhanta used, Saraswati used to sing and he couldn't sing at all. <laughs> and his devotees would go like, you yeah. <laughs> know. But his singing was full of bhakti. <laughs> so despite that, the expression wasn't up to the standard of the melodies or the abilities to sing nicely. Still, for some, it was transcendental happiness. So you can see there's two elements there. And that's a long session. I don't want to get into that. I'm just mentioning that. 
And then when Ruchi develops it to another level, then it turns into Ashakti, complete attachment for Krishna. And one of the core symptoms on that level is the devotee does not waste a moment of time. They're always engaged in doing some devotional activities, and they, if somebody tries to waste their time, they actually become upset. <laughs> Prabhupada exhibited that in his, you know, preaching program when he was here. When he had to go someplace, and there was some devotees who were designated to go with him, if they weren't ready, he'd go. He wouldn't wait. You get in the car, they're not ready, go. Sometimes he would chant his Gayatri, and the devotees would sit down to chant their Gayatri, and Prabhupada was fast with his Gayatri. He get up and leave, and the devotees are trying to go, you know, catch up with the guy, so they could run after Prabhupada. So, a pure devotee and someone at least on the platform of Ashakti doesn't waste a moment of time. They use every moment in relationship to the, some activity of devotional service. That's one of the symptoms. There's nine. It's mentioned in Nectar Reversion. There's nine qualities of the platform of Ashakti. And then uh, that's that's the fifth verse, and and uh, then Baba, as we were hearing this morning from Bhuta Bhava and Prabhu, some of the characteristics of Baba, and these different ecstatic symptoms when one chants the holy names of the Lord, you know, standing of the hairs on the body, changing of the color of the complexion, a shivering. Uh, devastation falling to the ground, uh, sleeplessness, and so one of them. So if you have sleeplessness, you might be getting it. You might be on that platform. <laughs> <laughs> I was in Ljubljana and I was giving class, talking about ecstatic symptoms and chanting. And one devotee said, "Yeah, I was in my log cabin in the woods and." I was chanting and, and then I noticed the hairs on my body were standing up. And then she said, but then I realized it was cold. <laughs> so it was, it was a little, it was a different kind of ecstasy. <laughs> so yeah, so there are, and all of these, different symptoms are aligned with different elements. The earth element, the water element, the fire element. So the different types of symptoms means that that ecstasy comes in contact with one of the elements and that, and that particular type of ecstasy is exhibited like that. Just like tears comes into the water element like that. So these Symptoms, when they're actually real, they're signs of what we say deep affection for the Supreme Lord that is situated fully in their heart and within their mind. And there's so many characteristics for that also. So now we'll go into Prema Bhakti. These are the last two verses. Verse 7 is Prema Bhakti in separation. Verse 8 is Prema Bhakti in meeting. So we'll just recite the verses. If you have your the verses in front of you in some form. Otherwise, I'll just recite it line by line. Yugaitam nimeshena Pravishaitam Shunyaitam Jagat Sarvam Govinda Vigahename. So, in that explanation, there is an element of time. That time stops. <laughs> Does time ever stop? No. But the perception of time is individual. Just like I was just talking to one devotee who was who just left this morning and I said, did you have a good time here? He said, 
it went so fast. I said, yeah, that means you had a nice experience. Because the happier you are, or the more joyful you are, the more time moves faster, according to perception. When you're not feeling happy, time is slow. And if you're waiting, time stops. <laughs> you're waiting for something to happen, you're looking at your watch and it's not moving. <laughs> so yeah, time is a, also a precepting element that we receive differently according to our consciousness. Because time is not really the measurement that we use by these instruments. Time is Krishna's external energy that moves things along. So in this verse it says, one moment is like 12 years or more. So there was this mood of, of loving Krishna in separation from Krishna is Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's emphatic instructions for the active activities in Gaudiya Vaishnavism. He teaches that, that this is the this is the way we should practice Krishna consciousness on that level, longing for the association of the Lord. What is the qualification for longing? A desire to be with, <laughs> that's all. Of course, that comes about through our knowledge of Krishna. The more we know about Krishna, the more we hear about his wonderful activities, the more we experience his presence in our life, our, our attachment turns into our, to a, attraction. Our attraction turns into attachment, sorry. And as that attachment even develops more and more, then there is that without Krishna, the world seems like a void. Radharani, she's in that mood. There's one story where Radharani and Krishna are sitting together. And they're together and there's a bee you know, flying around. And the bee is kind of disturbing. So Madhu Mangal just happens to be there, Krishna's friend. You know, we all know Madhu Mangal, he's usually quite humorous. <laughs> and so he wants to help, so he chases the bee away. And the bee goes. And then he says, now another a term for the bee is Madhu. But Madhu also refers to Krishna. <laughs> so he, now he's telling Radharani, Madhu's gone. Madhu's gone. Oh, Madhu's gone. She's, he's right there. But, she, but when she hears that, all she can think of is that Krishna has gone. Where did Krishna go? But he's right there. But when she hears this, she goes into this ecstasy of separation and now, although Krishna is there, all she can think of is he's gone. That's Radharani. So we can't imitate that. <laughs> but that's a symptom of the ecstasy of separation. Even the thought of the person not being there is an, is an indication of the mood of separation. There is a term that's used, it's called purvaras. Purvaras is interesting. It means loving Krishna before meeting Krishna. Mm -hmm. Now you might say, how is, how is that understood? We all were with Krishna at one time in the spiritual world. At least in maybe one of his incarnations. But we were, with, we were in the spiritual world. Either in the Vaikuntha realm or in the Goloka realm, either one. And therefore, there's a, we can't possibly trace out that experience. It's not possible. Because we've been in the material world for, as it says, the conditioned soul is called Nitya Bada. Bada means condition and Nitya means eternal. 
eternally conditioned. Now, if you analyze that statement, it doesn't make sense. How can the soul be eternally conditioned if it was once with Krishna in the spiritual world? But the example, the statement wants to illustrate a point, that the point is that we cannot trace out our spiritual existence. And our existence in the material world is so long term that it appears it's eternal, but it's not. In other words, when something only, seems like it's the only way it ever was, in one sense, it's eternal. So we have two natures, conditional and constitutional. Conditional is our material existence. And then, as the scriptures explain, the living entity traversed through all 8,400,000 species. Before today, not all of 8 million, but at least all four, 8 million species of life until they get to the human form of life. And only when they get into a civilized human form of life, in other words, where they can rationalize, do they have the opportunity to perform the goal of life, which is pure bhakti, <coughs> and devotional service. So that existence cannot be understood in any way so, Purvaras means that, yeah, I'm learning about Krishna, and I'm also feeling that, I'm also understood that I was with Krishna one time, but I can't remember that. So there's a type of ecstasy that comes with that remembrance, which is not very pleasant. <laughs> it's the ecstasy of self criticism. Why did I leave Krishna? How could I be so foolish? What am I doing in this material world? I've given up that great treasure for this broken pieces of glass known as material existence. In the, con in the Christian tradition, they call it contrition. And contrite, something that is really, when we say, packed up. And it's a mood of, of uh, regret. Now, if you reach that stage, and devotees can reach that stage at any time in their Krishna conscious practice. It doesn't only come on the higher stage. But it, is a, it comes by way of chanting. That, there is a, that ecstasy comes and the devotee cries. Boy, what a fool. <laughs> Here I am in this material world. And then, so that is the beginning of this, this element of separation from Krishna, which can begin at earlier stages, but is manifested on the higher stages. Yeah. This idea of separating from Krishna. So what is this love and separation? What, and how is it explained? It's hard to explain it. I'm gonna try. <laughs> it's understood as when you have some affection and love for someone, and then that person is no longer there, there is this feeling of emptiness. But then there is a, a concomitant feeling of for wanting to fulfill that emptiness by longing for that person to be back. So this longing and the emptiness together brings about this feeling of, of ha unhappiness. And I can only be happy if that person again returns. Now, in the material world, we, get, we see something that is similar, but it doesn't have the same, we, we say, substance. In the sense that we see even people who love each other, they're separated. But if the separation is too long, the person will move on. And go, go and find something to fulfill that need, maybe with another person or another situation. That's usually what happens in the material world. But in the spiritual world, there's nothing that can replace Krishna. And nothing, the devotee doesn't want anything to replace Krishna. And that longing is so strong that actually 
Krishna enters into the hearts of the devotee and they feel a kind of happiness in their anxiety to be with Krishna at the same time. Okay? Does that make sense? Just like they say, well, Krishna never leaves Vrindavan, right? But he did. Well, what does that mean? Is that a contradictory statement? He never leaves Vrindavan. That means he's, he's in the hearts of his devotees in Vrindavan who are feeling that separation. And because their love is so perfect and so continuous, he manifests himself in their hearts. And in that sense, he's with them in a mood of separation. Um, this is, this can only be done with the Supreme Personality who got it, not on this material level. Let me see some of these other points of this verse here. And then of course there are different ecstatic symptoms that are manifest. That as soon as you hear something about Krishna, it brings about a certain ecstatic feeling, whether his flute, his dress, his smile, anything that indicates something about him, either his paraphernalia, his activities, or his personal qualities and appearance, all of these bring about a certain type of ecstasy, which increases the longing to be with him because that's not satisfying. But it gives some pleasure because in one sense it's not different from Krishna, but still the, the devotee is not satisfied. <laughs> Raghunath Das Goswami, one of the greatest of all of the eternal manjaris, he's Rati Manjari in the spiritual world. In his ecstasy of separation from Radharani, he's more interested in Radharani than Krishna. The manjaris, the mandris don't associate with Krishna. If they do, it's just to make some arrangement for Radharani to be with him. They don't have a relationship with Krishna directly. Krishna's, Radharani's girlfriends do, like, 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 like Lalita and uh, Vishaka and so many, and Chandravali and so many of the girlfriends of Krishna, uh, Radharani, also have loving relationships. But the Manjaris are simply focused on Radharani. And they also love Krishna too, but their love for Radharani is exhibited that they want to bring Radharani to Krishna. And they want to put themselves as an assistant to bring about that rather than be with Krishna themselves. And also Radharani is also like that. <laughs> She, sometimes she sees that Krishna wants to be with another gopi. So she'll go to that gopi and teach that gopi how to please Krishna because she's expert at that. Her expertise, she knows Krishna better than Krishna knows himself. <laughs> you might find that in married life too. <laughs> You want to find out about the husband, just ask the wife. He can't explain himself, but she can explain him. Now, that's a mundane statement, but anyway. <laughs> but the point is, you know, the Radharani, she knows Krishna so well that everything about her is simply meant to give pleasure to Krishna. Whatever she wears, her decorations, her movements, her dress, everything, all of these are transcendental personalities that appear as assistants to Srimati Radharani to give pleasure to Krishna. And when Krishna sees, like, she wears a special locket, and when he sees that, he actually becomes ecstatic just because it's connected with her. So she's expert at creating happiness in Krishna constantly. And she knows more than anyone what pleases Krishna. So she'll go to these other gopis to see, 
she would rather be with Krishna herself, but in order to please Krishna sometimes, this is not always, sometimes she gets angry when he's with somebody else. That's another part. When you try to explain love, you can't. So I'm, I'm just making an attempt. It's not possible to explain love. Nobody can explain love. Even those who have it, they can't explain it. It's just an experience. And so her, her love, in that sense, is to give Krishna pleasure. So she teaches the other gopis what pleases Krishna. So, and that's her love for Krishna because she knows Krishna wants to be with another gopi. Uh, so even Radharani will do that. She'll put herself, not always. <laughs> Sometimes she gets angry when he's with them. Just like one time Krishna was supposed to meet her. And she's waiting, 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 waiting. And she's not, you know, he's not coming. And then Lalita comes to see what, what's, 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 what's happening with Radharani. And then she sees Radharani is not happy and she's asked and she said, yeah, well, Krishna was supposed to come to meet me and he's late. <laughs> he's not coming. Lalita said, don't worry, I'll find out. So she knows where to go. Lalita is very good. She's like, she's fiery. She's got a very fiery personality. And when she sees Krishna, he's going to get it. <laughs> so she goes. And she uh, finds Krishna with one of the, uh, what we call it, challenging gopis. There's two groups, the left-wing gopis and the right-wing gopis. Right-wing gopis and the left-wing gopis. Okay. And Radharani is left-wing gopi. That means sometimes she's favorable and sometimes she's contrary. So the, but the right-wing gopis are always favorable to Krishna. They're humble, they're submissive. They don't disagree with Krishna at all. And they have pure love for Krishna. Left-wing gopis use other methods to bring about that loving relationship. Just like in a married life, if everything is nice all the time, it's boring. So once in a while you need to have a good fight just to keep things moving. You know? But there's no, you know, maybe you can tell some more stories about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's just to keep things moving. It just makes life a little more exciting. <laughs> so so that, that's where do we get that from? It's coming from, you know, spiritual world. So that, yeah. So Lalita finds Krishna with another gopi and she's just, oh, you rascal. You making my mistress wait. You, you're going to get it. <laughs> She's chastising. Krishna is caught. He doesn't know what to do. So then she's going back to Radharani and Krishna's following. He wants to make, he wants to apologize. So when he, he gets there, Radharani's not in the mood for any apology. So she won't look at him. She won't talk to him, nothing. She just walks away and Krishna's stuck. And then she goes home and she takes her birdcage, which is color of blue, same color as Krishna, and she throws it because it reminds her of Krishna. And she sees the Jamuna and she thinks, she becomes very unhappy looking at the Jamuna, so she won't look at it because it's blue. And she takes her blue sari and throws it. <laughs> and now she's in Mon. She's not good. She's angry. And so Krishna is thinking, what am I going to do? <laughs> I got to make up with Radharani somehow. So he goes to Vrinda. Vrinda is the assistant to Purnamasi. Purnamasi is the CEO of, of Rinda. <laughs> she orchestrates all of these pastimes and her assistant is Rinda. Rinda is Tosi Devi actually. And they work together. Purnamasi makes the plan, Rinda helps it and carries it out. So Krishna goes to Rinda and said, this is the situation. Rinda said, no problem. We'll come up with a plan. Radharani, you know, she likes astrologers. So you dress up as a female astrologer, not just astrologer, female. You put all the mendy on, you know. <laughs> and, 
and then you go. And Radharani is sitting there with her girlfriends in one little grove. And then this female astrologer comes, it's actually Krishna. And, and then the, the gopis look and they think, who's that? We don't know that one. <laughs> Must be a new gopi. So she comes and then she announces, I've heard Radharani is not feeling good. So I've come to take her, you know, astro astrological reading. <laughs> this will help. <laughs> so, Radharani is, she's, she's submissive. She doesn't recognize it's Krishna. So Krishna comes and he's reading her feet. He's holding her feet and looking on the lines on her feet, not her hands. <laughs> and he's, then he says, yeah, I see the problem. Yeah, you should, uh, you should forgive Krishna. <laughs> <laughs> Radharani gets more angry. She said, get this girl out of here. <laughs> and so, before she gets too angry, Krishna disappears, goes back to Vrinda. He got another plan, <laughs> this one didn't work. <laughs> so Radharani's man is even more, you know. So this one, then Vrinda says, yeah, don't worry, we always got some plan. <laughs> so, yeah, Radharani's very inclined to sadhus, so dress up as a sadhu. And he dressed up like something like, looked like Lord Shiva. <laughs> yeah, he put on uh, like, what is that? Uh, he had his din din drum, <laughs> and he had his, what is that? What, what does he wear? Huh? Deer skin. Deer skin. Deer skin, yeah, yeah. So he's all dressed up as a sadhu. And Radharani's sitting with her friends again. And then and they said, oh, a sadhu, Ooh, wow, sadhu has come. And everyone becomes, you know, feeling fortunate. <laughs> and so he walks in, he's very grave. And then Radharani said, oh, my dear sadhu, please come. It's our good fortune you have come into our association. What can we do for you? What can we offer to you? Yes, one thing, what is that? Forgive Krishna. <laughs> and Radharani thinks, can't disobey the sadhus. It's not good. <laughs> so that's the end of that pastime. <laughs> and then Krishna somehow or other, you know, gets back with Radharani. So the, these, are, these are more examples of how Radha and Krishna carry out their leelas in the modes of meeting and separation. But this mood of separation can be cultivated as we practice devotional service. But only when we reach that stage of loving Krishna will it actually manifest fully in that mood. Because Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has said, we should execute our devotional service in that mood of separation from Krishna. Prabhupada would speak about the sahajyas, those who take things cheaply. They don't talk about separation. They always talk about their experience. Well, I was with Krishna last night. Prabhupada talks about he met one lady she came to him and said, yes, last night I had a dream and Krishna was pulling on my sari. <laughs> so, so when, when, you know, these are just imaginations, pretense. This is a good group we call taking things cheaply. And sometimes they actually believe that they're actually with Krishna, but it's just because they want to be, they actually create this mindset that is not even, it's false. And some of them do it just to get some cheap adoration like that. Bhakti Siddhanta talks about that in relationship to this verse. That we should always be in the mood of wanting Krishna. And he said, Prabhupada says, we should serve in such a way that Krishna wants to come and accept our service. 
we should do that service, as we mentioned, with two moods, two things. One is the mood. Want to, want to pleasing Krishna by our service and doing the service so nicely that Krishna wants to come. Just like when, you, when those of you who cook, um, it's not the taste of the cooking that attracts the deity. It's how the food looks. You see, we also experience that. When we see prashadam and it looks really nice, it kind of excites your desire to, to taste it. So Prabhupada said, looks, texture, taste, in that order. This is for deity worship. I remember one time we went to Jagannath Puri and we were there just for the Rathiyatra, but it hadn't started yet. It was still during the time of the uh, Anavatsara when Jagannath is still sick. So devotees showed up and we needed some place to eat. We, had no, we didn't set up our kitchen yet. So we found this restaurant right near the Jagannath temple. And so the devotees were lining up, and we were going in 50 at a time. It was about three or 400 of us. And when I finally got in there, they were, they were taking the, the food and throwing it on the plate. <coughs> and when I saw that, and the other devotees felt the same way, I just left. It wasn't at all very attractive. They just were throwing it and it was going all over the plate. In other words, they were hurrying so fast that the serving was really, we might say, and to use the word, sloppy, careless. And the appetite was lost. <laughs> we didn't, so I, for me, I just walked out. I didn't want to. So yeah, but when everything looks nice and it's served nice and it's prepared in that same mood, then it becomes very attractive. And so Prabhupada uses that example, and it's also mentioned that we should be trying to catch Krishna by the quality of our devotion. That means to attract him by the quality of our devotion. So that means we always try to do our devotional service in the best possible way. And Krishna knows what is what you can do and what you can't do. But when he sees you're giving your utmost in your, in your, in your devotional service, that attracts him. And then Krishna will come. He'll accept your service. But then what does he do? He disappears. <laughs> and he's gone again. And you're feeling that separation again. The satisfaction you get that when he, knowing that he's accept your service, because you might say, well, how do we know that he's accepting my service? That's another question. Prabhupada answered that one too. <laughs> how do we know when we please Krishna? Prabhupada said, you're pleased. <laughs> you're pleased. Because you are part and parcel of Krishna. And if you're pleased, that means that Krishna was pleased by your service. That's only in devotional service, not something material. That's something else. <laughs> so, and that's more, Lord Chaitanya is more or less like running after Krishna in the mood of serving Krishna. So that's, that's how we pretty much execute our mood of uh, Vipralamba Bhav. Wanting to be with Krishna by attracting Krishna through our service and through the, the proper mood of service. Mood means I want to please Krishna. I want to make it so nice that he comes and he is pleased by whatever I offer. And whatever it is, doesn't matter what service it is. Okay, so what is, how are we doing on time? We've got 20 minutes left. Okay, that's, that's Vipra Lumber Bhav, and the last verse is Sambhog. Let's chant that. 
Aslisyava paravatam pinastumam adarshanam marmahatam karotuva yatapatava viradatu lampato mat pranam nastu I know no one as Krishna as my Lord, and he shall remain so, even if he treats me roughly by his embrace, or makes me broken hearted by not being present before me. He's free he's completely free to do anything and everything. He is my worshipful Lord unconditionally. These are the words of Srimati Radharani. <laughs> we may not have that. <laughs> you know, if we don't get some reciprocation in our devotional service, we may also become less enthusiastic. That's material that's not material, it's just a more of a consciousness of a devotee who hasn't reached the more developed stage of bhakti. But one who has, it doesn't matter. The word lumpato means dibanshi. Krishna is called lumpata by Radharani. He can mix with other women. The word adarshanam means he's not peering before me. Um, marmahata. This is really interesting. Marma, those of you who know a little bit about fighting, it's a, ter it's, it's a term that they use in fighting that you try to hit your opponent in vulnerable spots. And that way you can break your opponent easy. You know, those who know fighting know the vulnerable spots. And so Radharani says, he can even do that. He can make me broken hearted. He can cause me pain. It doesn't matter. I'm still his worshipful Lord unconditionally. So this is the, the mood of um, complete love for Krishna. And it culminates in this. This is called Sambhog. <clears throat> But there's one downside to Sambhog, <laughs> and that is <clears throat> when you're with Krishna, this is the gopis, this is Radharani, they also have this anxiety that Krishna is going to leave. So they can't be completely happy, even with him, because there's this thought that he's going to leave. Like, we're all happy, I'm happy because you're all here now, and then you're all going to leave and I'll be unhappy. <laughs> For a while. Huh? What did, I think she said something. What did, what did she say? We'll stay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Don't. Yeah. Okay, but the Bhavan will stay also. <laughs> oh, Joshua and his good wife will stay. <laughs> and we'll have part two of the retreat. <laughs> I mean, I'm into it. I would love it. Yeah. This, this retreat has been so satisfying for me. It's been so wonderful. And it's because of all of you. Just to be with all of you has been a nice experience. <clears throat> Yeah, so that, that mood is there, that the feeling of emptiness, even during the time of meeting, is a precept of the perceiving that soon Krishna will be gone. Like that. <clears throat> what story, there's one story that illustrates the gopi's love for Krishna. And I'll end with this one, then we can take some discussion. <clears throat> Krishna is with Narada Muni, and Narada says, Krishna, how are you? Krishna says, not so good, I got a headache. <laughs> oh, really? Well, what can we do? He said, well, there's only one thing that will relieve my headache, that's the dust of the, of the feet of my devotees. Oh. So Narada, yeah, Narada says, well, that's very difficult because devotees don't want to give you. Krishna said, go ahead, see what you can find. 
So he goes to the sages of Dunya Karanya Forest. They were associates with Lord Ramchandra. Later they became the Rishi Chari Gopis. And one of the six types of the six kinds of gopis, Rishi Chari Gopis, were the ones that were sages in the forest, and they met Ra Lord Ramachandra, and they wanted to have conjugal relationships with Ramachandra, but he said, not in this incarnation. So by the power of their bhakti, they actually became gopis in, in the spiritual world. But So Narada goes to them and says, you know, and they see Narada and they welcome him and they wash his feet and they, they say all the beautiful glorifications and Narada is so happy. And then they said, Narada, what can we do for you? This is a way of honoring a, a great person. When a person, great person comes, you welcome him nicely and then you say, what can I do for you? <laughs> what service can I do? This is the etiquette. So Narada said, yes, I've actually come for this for a reason. What is that? Well, Krishna's got a headache. Oh, really? Can we help? Yeah, that's why I'm here. What do I have to do? Oh, well, he says the only thing that will help is headache. The only medicine is the dust from your feet. Oh, Narada, what are you saying? This is, this is, no. <laughs> Dust from our feet on the head of the Supreme Personality of Godhead will go to hell. <laughs> Narada, you're asking too much. <laughs> so Narada kind of expected that. <laughs> so he left. <laughs> and then he tried others, and they all gave the same answer. Finally, he goes back to Krishna and says, <laughs> I failed. I couldn't find anyone. They all, they all, they're all afraid of going to hell. <laughs> And Krishna said, all right, well, go to the gopis in Vrindavan and see what you can find. So, he gets a little hope, heads out to Vrindavan. And the gopis, he says, oh, Narada Muni's here. Narada Muni Bhajai Veena Rakika Ravana Nare. Plays on his Veena. He's like a Jashvi. He's got. He, he plays on his harmonium when he travels around, <laughs> singing the glories of the Lord. <laughs> He's like our modern-day Narada. <laughs> really, I'm not. That's not an exaggeration. If you know, if you know what he does, that all he does is kirtan everywhere, and then, and that's what we need the most: kirtan. <clears throat> And so after worshipping Narada, they said, oh, the gopis asked the same thing, Narada, why have you come? Krishna got a headache. Oh, as soon as they heard that, they practically lost their life. <laughs> Krishna is suffering. They, the, the gopis used to think that, they would think that Krishna is walking on the grounds of Vrindavan and sometimes there's twigs and pebbles and different types of rocks that are not very smooth and Krishna's feet is getting all you know torn up and when they would think of that they would faint <laughs> just to think that Krishna's feet would be getting being caused pain by the, just by his walking so now when they heard that he had a headache they said what can we do Narada well he said only the dust from your feet will cure his headache and immediately they'd start taking off their bangles and they're scraping the dust from their feet and they're making these piles and, and Narada says, don't you know you're going to hell? Narada, quit it. Come on, take the dust and just bring it to Krishna. We'll go to hell forever, even if it relieves Krishna's headache for one moment. When Narada heard that, he couldn't believe it. <laughs> they were, this is the way to gopis. Gopis don't think anything about their own self, their own interest. They just want to please Krishna. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And so, he took the dust and brought it back to Krishna. And Krishna used this whole program just to show Narada who are the real devotees. <laughs> who are the real devotees? They will do anything to please the Lord. 
Okay, so. So we can, uh, if there's some discussion or anything.